great way to start. Good morning. Um, thank you for being here. I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to share my research and, and for a venue to get to know some new faces. For decades, biologists have observed that island taxa often evolve extreme body sizes, either gigantism or dwarfism relative to their mainland counterparts. And this phenomenon is called the island rule. Islands possess a collection of ecological factors that often promote the repeated evolution of interesting phenotypes. These ecological factors uh, include the fact that islands are often well isolated, they're relatively small, and therefore have a relatively uniform climate. In addition, uh, organisms arriving on islands are often provided with new food resources, and these island colonizing taxa are often freed from mainland predation pre pressures uh, and ecological competitors. And so these ecological factors uh, promote the repeated evolution in a wide array of taxa of a collection of phenotypes. And these phenotypes include altered reproduction, increased docility, often increased exploratory behavior, and the island rule, or the evolution of extreme body size. So one striking example of the evolution of gigantism is found on Gough Island. Gough Island is located in the central South Atlantic Ocean, and it is home to the largest wild house mice uh, in the world. House mice arrived on Gough Island approximately 200 years ago from Western Europe in ships that were in the vicinity to hunt aquatic mammals. And in that short time span, uh, they evolved to, this population evolved to be the largest wild house mice. So they're roughly twice the size of their mainland counterparts. So on your left here is a wild-derived inbred strain, uh, WSB, and it's representative of the size of mainland mice. And for the <coughs> remainder of the talk, I'll be referring to it as the mainland mouse. And so, although biologists have known about the island rule for decades, the genetic basis of the evolution of extreme body size on islands, including gigantism, uh, remains largely unknown. And in our lab, we develop genomic and genetic data sets uh, in an effort to understand the genetic mechanisms underlying the island rule. To date, we have identified 19 quantitative trait loci, or genomic regions, that are responsible for the differences in body weight and growth rate in our island and mainland mice. Additionally, we have sequenced tens of genomes of Gough Island mice, and therefore we know the mutations or uh, substitutions that are fixed between the island and mainland mice. And to this set of resources, I wanted to add a third data set that addresses how gene regulatory evolution contributed to the evolution of gigantism. And we expect patterns from these different data sets to overlap and reinforce one another, thus suggesting genetic mechanisms. Today, however, I'm just going to talk about the data set that addresses how gene regulatory evolution impacted the evolution of gigantism, but I'll return to the interaction of these data sets in the last part of my talk. <coughs> There's substantial evidence that complex traits evolve by evolution in gene regulatory elements. This includes traits such as height, um, disease susceptibility, uh, even body weight. Therefore, we hypothesize that substitutions, new substitutions or, uh, or extant substitutions rose to high frequency in Gough Island mice in gene regulatory elements. And these substitutions in gene regulatory elements cause divergence in gene expression in key metabolic organs in the island mice relative to the mainland mice. And consequently, there was divergence in metabolic activity in these organs, which ultimately contributed to the gigantism in Gough Island mice. To address this hypothesis, I took an RNA sequencing approach, collecting transcripts from three key metabolic organs, the gonadal fat pad, the hypothalamus, and the liver. These three organs interact with one another, and they regulate the intake and processing of metabolites, and they're essential for vertebrate growth. As I mentioned, I took transcripts from island mice and mainland mice, and these were collected in four-week-old individuals. Previous work in our lab had demonstrated that the growth rate between these strains is significantly different in the first six weeks of life. That's what we focused on this time point. Additionally, I took transcripts uh, from an embryonic time point in the liver, embryonic day 16.5, and in two week old individuals. And in all of these condi conditions, there was a striking amount of differential expression. So between 20 and 40% of gene expression was significantly differentially expressed between these strains. To gain organ specific insights into the metabolic divergence between these strains, I carried, a functional I carried out a functional enrichment analyses using K pathways and gene ontology terms. So in these types of analyses, particular biological pathways or, function, or functions are uh, associated with sets of down-regulated and up-regulated genes. And so for the remainder of the talk, when I refer to down-regulated or up-regulated genes, I'm referring to those genes whose uh, transcript levels were higher or lower in the island mice relative to the mainland mice. And so I'm just gonna share two examples of the type of biology 
that we can learn from this type of analysis. The first one I want to share with you is that we found evidence that Goff Island livers are maturing earlier and turning on metabolic pathways earlier than the mainland mice. And so here's some of the evidence for that data. What I did here in this panel is I just took a subset of gene ontology, gene ontology categories and I sorted them into five general categories. They're along the x-axis, cell cycle, immunity, development, mitochondrial processes, and metabolism. Uh, and these are, these are processes that are routinely used to study uh, liver development in inbred strains of mice and rats. And then above the zero line, you're looking at the number of upregulated genes in island mice relative to mainland mice in each of those categories. And below the zero line are the number of downregulated genes. And the colors of the bar simply indicate the intensity or magnitude of the differential expression on a long two scale. And so what we can do with these sort of uh, broken down patterns is we can say, for example, in the embryonic liver, we see that there's strong downregulation of developmental and cell cycle genes, but upregulation of metabolic uh, and particular mi uh, mitochondrial processes. And strikingly, when we look across the time points for which we have data, we see that these general patterns are dynamic. They change throughout the maturation of the liver. I want to show you the, uh, uh, what we learned again about the, the metabolic divergence in one other format. And so what I'm showing you here is a timeline of early postnatal, de or early postnatal development in the mouse from, from birth to about 30 days. And in the red circles, just again, indicate the time points for which I have uh, differential expression data in the liver. And then the divisions along the timeline are these major transitions in mouse development that again are often used in studies to characterize the liver in inbred mouse strains and, and, and rat strains. And what I've done below the line is I've just put particular cellular and metabolic processes and, and mapped those on this timeline. So this is like when particular processes begin or end. And the ellipses just mean that process continues for the remainder of the life of the mouse. And so what we notice in goth and mice is that specific pathways, such as the downregulation of developmental genes right at birth, and the upregulation, for example, of glucose production via glu gluconeogenesis and other metabolic pathways, these seem to be occurring earlier in goth and mice. Um, as you can see in the diagram here. And so, again, we've recorded dynamic uh, metabolic divergence uh, between island and mainland mice. I want to share one other example of, of the type of uh, how our gene regulatory data set indicated metabolic divergence, and this was in a, a four-week-old fat pad. Here we found evidence that the uh, fat pads were less differentiated and possibly more proliferative in the island mice relative to the mainland mice. So to appreciate this, I'm just going to show another diagram this is sort of a, a temporal timeline of fat cell differentiation. And uh, what's important to note here is that pre-fat cells, cells that are not exporting or storing lipids, that cell just with a little nucleus, they have a structure, an organelle called the primary cilium. And it's supported by a microtubule structure called the axoneme. And while this primary cilium is present, fat cells suppress signaling pathways that promote fat cell differentiation. Upon losing this primary cilium, fat cells can then begin to metabolize lipids store lipids and export lipids to other organs in the body. And strikingly, what we noticed in the Goff Island mice is there was a strong upregulation of uh, genes that contribute to primary cilium development and axonemal function. And so you can see some of those listed here. And at the same time, there was a strong downregulation of signaling pathways that promote fat cell differentiation. I've just pointed out two here, the PPAR and the insulin signaling pathway. And as you might expect, if these fat cell differentiation pathways are downregulated, so were uh, particular metabolic pathways, like I mentioned, lipid biosynthesis, fatty acid elongation, and even glucose metabolism. So again, this data suggests that in Goff Island mice, these fat pads are less differentiated than mainland mice, and in this less differentiated state, it might suggest they're actually in a proliferative state relative to mainland mice. So just to summarize some of these um, organ-specific gene expression patterns that I observed, we observed substantial differential expression in all the conditions we looked at, I spoke about two today, we noted that the livers are downregulating developmental and upregulating particular metabolic genes earlier than mainland mice. And lastly, I showed you that uh, the fat pads are less differentiated and possibly proliferative. For the last part of the talk, I want to return to this idea of using the many data sets in our lab to identify candidate genes that were involved in the evolution of gigantism. In particular, we're interested in differentially expressed genes that were within the QTL or the genomic regions that are responsible for the differences between our strains. And so we call these QTL DE genes where DE stands for differentially expressed. And you might imagine because these genes are differentially expressed, we might expect that there's substitutions or mutations in the regulatory elements of these genes that are responsible for the divergence and expression of those genes. And so I'm just gonna show you one example of the many QTL DE genes 
and how we can gain insight uh, into, these, into these candidate genes. So this uh, particular gene I'm going to talk about is on a QTL on chromosome 10, and these are just significant peaks, uh, significance peaks that indicate the locations of the QTL on particular chromosomes in the mouse. So again, this gene is on chromosome 10, it's called ARID5B, and it's represented here in a gene map where the vertical uh, blue bars indicate the exons and the spaces in between are the introns of ARID5B. And because we sequenced uh, tens of genomes of GOC5 in mice, we know that there are fixed substitutions, actually about 100 in the introns of ARID5B. And furthermore, we know that this uh, gene is downregulated in the liver of GOC5 in mice. And so what we can do is we can ask, are some of these substitutions in the introns overlapping with potential regulatory elements? And so to do this, we looked at ENCODE datasets. ENCODE datasets were generated uh, in a collaborative effort by numerous labs. And the goal of ENCODE datasets was to identify sequences that were potential transcription factor binding sites or chromatin mark hotspots to indicate regions of transcriptional regulation in particular tissues. So in this example, uh, we're looking at two of these ENCODE datasets, both in the embryonic liver, 16.5 and 14.5, and these are from the liver, that's what the L means. And this histone mark and these putative transcription factor binding sites overlap some of these substitutions. We also know that this gene is downregulated in the um, uh, fat pad of these mice. And so we can add an additional ENCODE data set that looked at potential transcription factor binding sites in adult adipose tissue. And again, what you'll note is that these uh, substitutions overlap some of these potential regulatory elements. Furthermore, we know something about this gene, as we do for some of the other QTL and DE genes. We know that ERIC-5B downregulates two transcription factors that promote fat cell development or, or maturation. And so again, this is just an example where we can use overlapping data sets to uh, strengthen our nomination of candidate genes involved in gigantism. So why does this matter? Well, uh, we've identified two metabolic signatures of the Eilich syndrome in Goth mice relative to mainland mice. First of all, metabolic divergence is dynamic. It spans from embryonic to postnatal time points. It didn't have to be that way. It could have been that it was just focused in one time point. We've uh, noted that uh, lipid storage and export is substantially different between island and mainland mice. And furthermore, as I mentioned, we have candidate genes that might have been responsible for uh, the evolution of gigantism. So these types of findings leave us in a strong position to identify the genetic mechanisms and consequent metabolic changes responsible for the island rule. And importantly, we can use this data now to compare to other taxa that experience the island rule. Thank you.